Well, as parents, Amy and I are figuring out together how to navigate the challenges of of parenting, how to teach our kids, how to be consistent, how to discipline in a way that is both effective and edifying. And one of the different things that we're learning is, is that our children are different. You know, what seems to be effective for one is, is not necessarily effective for another. We are also learning that there is lots of information out there and lots of experts. There are volumes of books, scores of articles, and no shortage of people with opinions on the correct or right way to parent. And there are times when when there are signs that perhaps we are on the right track and others that we feel utterly lost. You know, as we seek to communicate with our kids, you know, we wonder, are, are they even listening? Are they understanding what it is that we are hoping to communicate One book I read not so long ago commented on the the parent-child dynamic, and and I'm paraphrasing, but it said something to the effect of that your child will, over the course of their lifetime, likely encounter scores of people of whom they will have the opportunity to befriend, to form friendships. But they only get a couple of people who get to fulfill the role of parent in their lives. Warning against the temptation to to want to simply be a friend to your child. And one of the points that the author was making is that there is a certain authority that's inherent in being a parent, whether you or your child chooses to recognize it or not. And in our scripture for today, the gospel writer deals with this concept of authority. Specifically, Jesus' authority to teach. And I want to invite you to open up the Bibles you've brought with you from home or your, your pew Bibles or your mobile devices to Mark chapter 1. And as I've mentioned before, Mark moves at a really quick pace. And so here we are still in just the first chapter of Mark and and Jesus has already begun his ministry. Jesus is now teaching. We find Jesus here in the synagogue, a place where the Jewish people would have gathered in the community. Beginning at verse 21, they went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so our scripture this morning describes Jesus' first miracle in the gospel of Mark. And and yet the miracle, quite frankly, is not the point that the gospel writer is seeking to make here in this passage. Now twice the gospel writer remarks on Jesus' authority to teach. Did you notice both times? The first in verse 22 saying they were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And then again in verse 
27, saying that they were all amazed. What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey. First, the writer talks about Jesus' authority with respect to the scribes. Now, if you are familiar somewhat with the New Testament, perhaps you, you grew up in the church or you've been a Christian for a little while and have read some of the Gospels, then you will know that, that often the scribes, the Pharisees, and, and the elders are often grouped together and set against Jesus in the scene. And so it will be awfully easy for us to set up the scribes as, as straw man, just to say, well, well, of course, Jesus has authority over the scribes. But, but to do that would be to miss what the gospel writer is seeking to communicate here. You see, the scribes were, were valued within the temple and valued within the synagogue and valued within the community. The scribes would have been an authoritative resource at a time when information was far less available than today. Not only would they have been a precious resource, but a respected one. Looking back at some of the ancient texts, if we look at Ecclesiasticus, which is a part of the Apocrypha, or the, the hidden text, there we read verses about how valued these scribes were how much their wisdom was appreciated and how important their role was within the community. We do ourselves a disservice in understanding what the gospel writer is seeking to communicate by simply writing them off. What the writer is trying to communicate is is not simply that Jesus is smarter than the scribes, but rather that Jesus has authority over these who hold the wisdom of the community. Jesus has authority over the community. Secondly, the writer describes Jesus' authority over the unclean spirits. The point the gospel writer is seeking to make in all of this is that Jesus has authority over the material world and over the spiritual realm. Do you recognize that authority? How, how does Jesus' authority manifest itself in your own life? In the ways that you choose to live does your life testify that you acknowledge Jesus' authority over the material world and the spiritual realm? In other words, over all things. What is it that is so challenging about submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ? I think one of the reasons that we gather in worship on a weekly basis is in order to remind ourselves that we are not the centers of our universe, that there is an authority out there that is larger than our own desires because of our innate willingness to see ourselves as the most important character in our stories. So what is it that is so challenging about submitting to the authority of Jesus? What are those points of friction for you? I think one of the challenges that we face is, is that we have seen so many Christians. We have seen so many people who, who claim to be Christ followers who behave poorly or who use Scripture in such a way that is frankly dangerous. 
I shared with my small group this past week that, that I've been reading Harper Lee's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. Growing up, I, I had seen the movie um, a number of times, uh, apparently, because I can picture almost the whole story, but I had never read it. And I've been thoroughly engrossed in Harper Lee's characters. And, and one of her characters, one of the neighbors of Atticus Finch and his children, Miss Maudie, she's sitting with the children, Jem and Scout, and says, sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of another. How we know that to be true. And while that may be true, the challenge is that we see that kind of behavior and then we throw out the whole thing. And so, how are we to navigate this life? How are we to understand Jesus' authority over our own lives? I think another common point of friction is intellectual. We wonder, how can this be true, this ancient text? How are we discern what it has to say to us today? A part of my own faith journey was working through some of these challenges. And, and, and so there was a season of, of life where I spent time reading a number of, of what I would consider to be some of the great apologists of the Christian faith, people like C.S. Lewis and, and more, a more contemporary, the, the late Tim Keller. Another great Christian mind is John Lennox, who's professor emeritus of mathematics at Oxford. And it was in this season that I was, I was having a conversation with another pastor and and I said to them, sort of flexing my newly found intellectual muscle, quoting one of these thinkers that I had just mentioned to you. And what this pastor said in, in such a moment of sincere authenticity and, and frankly vulnerability was, Nick, what I have found in my own life is that at some point, you just need to decide whether or not it's true. At some point, you just need to decide whether or not it's true. So how do we learn if we make that choice? How do we learn to reclaim Scripture's Authority and the authority of Jesus Christ, understanding that God has, has given us these minds to think, to discern, to sift through. I think one of the final obstacles that we face, particularly in this context here in Fort Lauderdale, in one of the wealthiest communities in one of the wealthiest counties in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. One of the dangers we face is our own self-sufficiency. The lie that we have learned that we are enough, that we can do it on our own, that I can rely on on myself. A diamond is forever. There's a phrase coined in 1947. It's the centerpiece of what is considered by many to be the most successful advertising campaign in modern history. It was named slogan of the century by advertising age. And the De Beers group, now synonymous with diamonds at that time was seeking to create the need or desire for diamonds 
within the culture. And while wedding rings had been used for centuries, the diamond wedding ring is, is actually an invention of the 20th century. It's only in the last 150 or so years that that has become the expectation. Well, as the story goes, Francis Garrity, a copywriter for the advertising company hired De Beers, uh, that was hired by De Beers, was working late at night against a deadline to come up with the marketing campaign that was going to make diamonds desired. And at five o'clock in the morning, tired and desperate, wrote out these now iconic words. A diamond is forever. Unsure if it was even grammatically correct, (laughs) she offered it up because it was what she had. That was in 1947. By 1951, according to De Beers, eight out of ten brides were receiving diamond engagement rings. Talk about a successful campaign. This moment of divine inspiration, unplanned, born out of desperation. You see, friends, it is in those moments where we are faced with the certainty that we are not enough that we are so often finally able to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. And yet, many of us in here may never be faced with that kind of desperation. One evening, one evening, one of our little ones recently um, got out of bed and, and came out of their room um, with, with one of what seems to be a, a host of reasons to get out of bed and resist going to sleep. Another drink of water, I have to go to the bathroom, my belly hurts, I need a tickle back rub, whatever it is. And after a very brief negotiation, I reminded our child that they needed to go back into the bed, that they were not to return, lest there be a consequence tomorrow. To which this child looked at me, turned around, walked to the door of their bedroom, and without saying a word, and then disappeared for the night. (laughs) I'm not even sure what to do with that. (laughs) After all, they did what I was asking. We're pretty sure that the gesture came from one of our beloved grandparents. But I was reminded in that moment just how tenuous this authority is. And that ultimately, as with Jesus Christ, my child chooses whether or not to submit to the authority that we have as parents. And it makes our authority no less true whether they choose it or not. In the same way, whether or not we choose to submit to Christ's authority has no impact on whether or not Jesus Christ has authority over all creation. The question is, what will we do with it? The choice is ours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.